Quiet, please. Action. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Bermudez. I was the director of the film Pharaoh's Quest, The Curse of Amset Ra. And today I wanted to take a look behind the scenes at this big film and take a look at all the different sets from the film, share some behind the scenes anecdotes, and take a look at some of the practical effects and how they were done. Now, strangely enough, the place where we're going to start is actually at the very end of the movie, specifically the ending that takes place in 2020, where Hiram Aziz gets terrorized by a reawakened Amset Ra who then goes back to sleep. The reason why I'm starting here is because, interestingly enough, this scene was not shot for this movie originally. It was originally shot for Johnny Thunder and the Wisdom of the Ancients when the ending had a completely different outcome to it. But when that got chopped out, uh, this scene was cut out, but by then it had already been filmed. So when it came time to write Pharaoh's Quest, The Curse of Amset Ra, uh, this scene was seen as a good ending to the film that could then tie into what happens later on down the line. So it was only a matter of just repurposing the original footage, upgrading it to meet standards of the rest of the film. Just a couple of years later, when principal photography on Pharaoh's Quest, The Curse of Amset Ra officially began, the first set that was utilized was actually one that appears closer to the middle of the Cursed Cobra statue. The reason why that I started here was because the set is very low-key. Uh, it doesn't have much outside of the main set itself. And because of everything in the film, this is something that's fairly closely adapted from how it appeared in the original storyline of the Lego sets, especially in how the Cursed Cobra statue was defeated, so it made it easier to film as opposed to later sets in the film. So this set here is the Catacombs Underneath Beersheba set, where the Golden Crystal is located as well as the Giant Scarab statue. The reason why I chose to film this second was because, again, it's a smaller set, not heavily involved, but it also had to be separated from the main Beersheba set simply to make filming easier and to make it easier to animate within the catacombs as well. One of the features that I like here is the way that I integrated the water features to not only show where the water in that well comes from, but also to give like an ancient feel to these catacombs. Now here's a set that in practice ended up being a lot bigger than I originally anticipated. This is the set for Archibald Hale's camp, as well as his big tent where he has all of his scientific equipment, all of his research equipment, where he takes his notes and takes care of his studies. The reason why this set ended up being so big was not only to create the endless expansiveness of the desert, but also to make sure that all the different vehicles that Jake Reigns and his entourage use could fit somewhere on the set so that I could realistically have a motor pool there. So in case you're wondering, yes, this, the tent is entirely practical. It's not just a facade. It is only half a tent, I might say, but it is still a practical set. So here's the inside. Now, everything I designed on the tent was to make it look as temporary and kind of ramshackle as possible. So you can see how the uh, how the canvas I built it specifically to look like it's haphazardly draped. The boards, the wood boards that hold everything up, looks a little mismatched. But also everything is designed to still look robust enough, and that you can still believe that the tent can stand up underneath its own weight. And in case you're wondering, no, I do not have photos of this version of the set after the tent has been destroyed. Uh, it's very similar. It's just. The way I built the tent was also, because it was designed to be a look ramshackle, I also built it so that it could still easily collapse while still being durable, so that when it came time to actually shoot that scene, I just needed to like remove a few panels, fold a couple things in, and then you got the basically the effect of the tent having been destroyed. For the Rise of the Sphinx film set, I went along the same lines as the Cursed Cobra statue set, in that you're out in the barren desert with just the Lego set sitting there. 
uh, when it came time to film and actually film the whole chase across the quicksand, a lo all of it uses the same set that you see here. It was just a matter of moving a few shrubs and a few props around to give the illusion that the set was continuing on and on. And also another fun fact is that this set is also the same set as the one for the obelisk after it's been destroyed. It was literally a matter of just removing the sphinx and replacing it with the destroyed obelisk and again just moving those plants and shrubs around. And then on the exact opposite end of the spectrum you have the Staff Canyon. This is a massive set. This took a lot of time to build and to layer up to create all those different layers to give the illusion of this being an actual desert canyon while still being practical for filming purposes. And I really like the way it turned out, especially since all of the holes, all of like the effects of like seeing like the holes going into the ground of like the underground catacombs, that was not simulated. Unlike the Beersheba courtyard, none of that was simulated. Everything was literally layered one on top of another. The cliff, the top of the cliff was literally there, as you can see. The top of the cliff with the base of the cliff below, and the cat and with the whole set literally being built on top of the catacombs that sit beneath them. And I even specifically designed the base of the canyon so that there is a hole, so that when you open up the shrine and go through the, that shrine, there is actually a hole in there that leads down into the catacombs below. But just like the tent, if you look at the back of this set, as you can see all the lattice posts back there that are literally holding this entire set together and holding it up. This set also was multiple sets in one in that you can see on the back here attached to that support structure in the back was the green screen that was used for anything in the film that required green screen. On a similar note, here is the Ancient Egypt set, specifically the Ancient Egyptian farm. Uh, everything about this is as historically accurate as possible. Uh, I did research on what houses would look like, what the canals would look like, what everybody would be realistically wearing, and then put that into practice, and then maybe tweaked a couple things around just for the sake of making filming easier. But what's unique about this set is that this set is also elevated like the previous one. However, it's not so much for the continuation of the environment, but here it's more for space saving purposes because directly underneath this set is Pharaoh Amset Ra's throne room. So you can see the throne room down here with all of his treasure. In fact, historical accuracy was something that I really emphasized when creating this film in order to make ancient Egypt, World War I, Beersheba, and 1920s Egypt feel as authentic to their original time periods as possible, minus the whole supernatural mummies coming back to life thing. I don't have any pictures of the Barrel Bar or Beersheba courtyard sets, but along those same lines, both of those were designed to be as accurate to their original locations as possible. And also, fun fact, during the development of this film, another film titled The Bartender's Tale was filmed as a 24-hour animation contest entry, and it was filmed using the same barrel bar set. It ultimately was not finished in time for the competition, but it was eventually released uh, retroactively, I should say, on May 3rd, 2024, as part of the 20 Years Young celebration. And that brings us to the final set, this absolutely massive three-movie spanning final set that is Omset Ra's Scorpion Pyramid. So this set's interesting in that it has technically has a practical interior, but it's built out from the back of the Scorpion Pyramid like you can see in this photo here. Uh, you can see elements here that are related both to Pharaoh's Quest, The Curse of Omset Ra, and a future in the past. Patrick the Movie also filmed using this exact same set, even though there's nothing related to that film specifically in any of these photos. As for the reason why I would shoot three films simultaneously, the main purpose for that was to maintain continuity between different films. I had to film all of those things happening 
simultaneously while making sure everything was staged properly. There might be a few hints that were thrown around in between these different films connecting them all together, but I still wanted to make sure that everything that you see in each of these films is specifically for that film. And to finish off, here's taking a closer look at that burial chamber part of the set. So when I was designing this part of the set, I knew I wanted to mix in some science fiction elements in order to help sell the reveal that Omset Ross magic is literally just alien technology. But I also still wanted to make it still clear that we're still inside of an ancient Egyptian tomb. Primarily the machine, but also a few additional things within the burial chamber as well to sell that idea that things are a little bit different in this room. So overall, it was a really great experience making this film. Not only did I get to experiment with new ways to pull off different effects, but I also got to play around a little bit with being in a different time period, having everything more explicitly supernatural compared to the Johnny Thunder saga, and also having this completely different set of characters. At that time, archaeology was different. How would people back then react to like those these supernatural occurrences in a time where archaeology was less about learning about history and more about fame and glory? So it was a lot of like deconstructing and playing around with those character archetypes. Also tying everything into historical events like World War I and specifically the Battle of Beersheba. Uh, it was definitely a big departure from the Giant Thunder Saga simply because it's set in the past, whereas the Giant Thunder Saga is present day. So that also created a nice contrast. And that concludes this behind the scenes featurette. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you again soon. Nice one.